Hey, good morning, everyone. We'd like for you to uh, thank you for stopping by the oil and gas conference. This is our 25th year, and we have a really cool uh, sit down with Artrim, and he is with Rystack. Good morning, Artrim. Are you having a good day? Um, thank you. Thank you, Stu, and good morning, everyone. Um, uh, today, I'm going to uh, share some of our latest views on the, the U.S. Uh, land oil and gas market. Um, of course, it was a very challenging uh, quarter, very challenging four to five months since the oil price crash and uh, the start of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but still, uh, I chose a pretty optimistic uh, title for this presentation uh, because there are some signs that the activity in uh, several major oil and gas basins is actually coming back uh, and uh, there are some positive outlooks uh, uh, which we are now having for uh, late 2020 and 2021. First of all, um, the U.S. shale industry, both in peace and service companies, uh, they were under tremendous financial pressure in the last four to five months. Um, uh, to some extent, we saw a record high uh, number of companies uh, which were pretty close to the financial distress. Quite a large number of Chapter 11 cases already filed. Uh, we're still quite far from the activity, Chapter 11 activity level, which we had in 2016, when more than 140 uh, ENP and all food service companies uh, in the U.S. filed Chapter 11. But um, uh, in the first seven months of the year, the total number of cases uh, has already approached 16, which is comparable to the full year number from 2019. Uh, in terms of the number of cases, uh, it probably doesn't look that extreme. But if you look at the total debt behind these Chapter 11 filings, then the situation is actually uh, looks quite unprecedented because for four months in a row, uh, we have seen roughly 13 to 15 billion dollars of total debt uh, behind these Chapter 11 cases for the first time in history. Uh, total uh, defaulted debt in 2020 year to date is already 70 billion for the energy industry in the US, which is comparable to the full year figures uh, which we saw in 2016. So what is really unique this time compared to the previous downturn is that there are many large to mid-sized companies from different industry segments. Uh, on service side, we see both offshore players and also a lot of suppliers. Uh, pretty sizable pressure pumpers like BJ services. Uh, on the MP side, it is a mix of conventional focused, pretty large producers like California Resource Corporation, Bruin MP, Danbury Resources, and also some uh, leading uh, from a several years ago perspective, shale producers like Chesapeake or Whiting Petroleum. So a lot of um, uh, more than 20 companies uh, with uh, more than 500 million dollar in debt already filed Chapter 11 this year. Uh, another important topic uh, from the financial perspective is the public capital issues. Uh, we know that equity markets um, uh, became closed for the shale producers already in 2017. So we have seen very limited new equity issues since that time. And the situation didn't really change this year. Uh, on the debt side, the activity was very limited last year. This year, when it comes to the new debt, uh, we're not really seeing that in the market. Uh, but there are some companies which are rolling over on their maturities. So that uh, the actual debt issues increased a little bit. Uh, but again, it's not really a new debt. It's just some larger players which are either unable to pay back debt maturities or not really willing to do so. In the end of the day, optimal uh, capital structure suggests a certain portion of debt for all these companies. Um, looking at quarter two results and implied uh, capital guidance or, and production guidance for the remainder of the year, if you compare it to what we see now on the implied production for the US uh, light or focus producers compared to what they guided initially back in February, it is a big change uh, because our peer group of around 40 dedicated light oil companies and also super majors, uh, initially they were targeting almost 4.6 million barrels a day in net oil production from the US onshore for 2020. 
Now this number is down to 3.8 billion barrels a day. So it's around 18% downward provision over the last seven months. And directionally, it is a big change because the original guidance was actually implying sequential growth from the level where we were in uh, late 2019 throughout 2020. Now we are talking about quite material sequential decline in 2020. If you look at individual producers, um, it is a very consistent uh, message for all majority of these companies. We're talking about um, a small, uh, maybe 10 to 20 percent um, sequential declines throughout 2020. There is just a handful of exceptions, uh, companies like Hess, also Chevron, Matador and Exxon. In our view, they will still be able to uh, achieve a certain growth on the full year basis, but they will also face, might face modest sequential declines. Uh, another major topic uh, uh, which we discovered in the latest earnings season, in the latest reporting from uh, the EMPs, is that they're still able to realize some capital efficiency gains. So ultimately, uh, quite many companies, um, they're now guiding a little bit lower capital spend uh, compared to what they got it in the quarter one earnings season with relatively the same production guidance. Uh, in fact, many people were surprised how quickly during this downturn, lower spot prices for various service works became reflected into the actual contracts because spot prices, they declined by around 20 to 30% in most segments in the last five months. And operators, they were actually quite successful going uh, to their service providers and suppliers and renegotiating the existing contracts. So there is quite material cost deflation, drill and completion costs are getting lower. Uh, some people believe that it is a cyclical uh, component uh, because service providers have to operate with negative or zero margins. So it is not sustainable in the next recovery cycle, but in short term, operators are definitely able to realize some additional capital efficiency gains. Uh, another big topic um, uh, is production curtailments. So we know that a lot of volumes were shut in uh, in April and May. Uh, total curtailments in the country, uh, they peaked in May 2020. And if you look uh, just at the public company communication, a peer group of around 25 producers, uh, they shut in around million barrels a day uh, at the peak in May 2020. The volumes started coming back already in June, even though majority of the companies, they started bringing back this production uh, towards the end uh, of June. So July um, was the month when uh, production posted the most significant positive production change. And based on the latest guidance uh, on this chart, we are not looking at the empiric data yet, uh, but we will explore it later in the presentation. It is just implied from the company guidance. So currently the industry targets um, that most of these curtailments will be brought back online by the end of quarter three. It's just a handful of producers, for, for example, Pioneer Natural Resources, and they shut in around 7,000 barrels a day of legacy production, the least economic vows and they plan to keep them offline for a prolonged period of time. So some volumes, some of these uh, marginal volumes from stripper wells, uh, they won't come back online anytime soon, um, not before oil prices improve further, maybe to $50 per barrel. Uh, but all these remaining shatins, uh, they really contribute to a very small portion of total curtailments. And most volumes are really coming back. So this was an overview uh, of the latest um, uh, quarter two results, the latest TNP company communication. Now uh, let us also look at, uh, at some empiric data and the actual activity trends. Uh, a lot of people look at the drilling activity, at the recounts, and we went from the, uh, through the period of unprecedented uh, collapse in the activity level. Horizontal oil focused drilling declined by around 75% uh, from the level where it was in the middle of March. Uh, activity stabilized in the first week of July, and in the most recent weeks, we were generally seeing uh, normal weekly noise. Some operators are still cutting a uh, handful of the rigs, but there are a few others like Parsley Energy, which actually restored drilling operations um, with a couple of rigs in the last uh, month. In the most active basin, the Permian in West Texas and New Mexico, uh, activity also stabilized 
uh, Delaware, New Mexico is now the largest contributor to the total drilling among all core sub basins. Uh, but we are seeing quite significant reallocation of the rigs almost every weeks, uh, every week. And this is a normal situation uh, in the low activity phase because operators with large acreage positions, uh, when they're running just a handful of rigs, they have to prioritize the certain projects. And whenever they're done uh, with the drilling of a new project in one part of the acreage, the same rig can be utilized in the completely different part of the acreage. For example, in the most recent weeks, a lot of rigs were reallocated from Southern Midlands to Martin County in the Northern Midlands. And uh, 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 to some extent, this creates a little bit of inefficiency because uh, more time is actually spent on moving the rigs between different parts of the acreage. When it comes to the outlook for the drilling activity for the remainder of the year, uh, I think we can just look at the uh, permit activity, the number of drilling uh, permits uh, approved every month in major oil basins. And uh, normally permits are viewed as um, noisy predictors of future activity. Operators have this tendency to overissue the permits. A lot of permits never get drilled. But when you look at basin level kind of aggregated trends, um, uh, permits, they still tell you something about the direction of drilling activity changes in the next two to three months. So permit activity reached the bottom in May. And in June, there was a certain rebound. Uh, several operators, they executed major permitting rounds. But in July, activity actually declined back to the bottom, which we saw in May. So the key takeaway from this chart is that most likely we shouldn't really expect any meaningful recovery in the drilling activity in the next few months, not before uh, 2021. Uh, most operators, uh, they uh, reached a certain running rate of the rig activity, a certain number of rigs, and they plan to maintain this very low rig activity level, still focusing on the free cash flow generation and uh, trying to achieve um, uh, decent year-end results. Uh, another very important metric which we monitor quite closely, and it's arguably more important metric when it comes to uh, production forecasts, it is the fracking activity, the number of wells uh, which are fracked in the country every week or month. And this is where we have to use some alternative data sources because the public disclosure, for example, from Frac Focus Chemical Disclosure Registry, uh, is both incomplete and it also comes with very significant reporting lack of three to nine months. So even if you look at 2019, uh, there is around 5% of the wells uh, which are never reported to Frac Focus, which will never be reported to Frac Focus. Uh, but generally, uh, activity slowed down a little bit in the second half of the last year, but early in 2020, we saw a pretty strong seasonal recovery driven primarily by oil basins. When oil prices crashed, fracking activity slowed down even faster than uh, what we saw uh, for the drilling one. So the bottom was reached in June uh, with only 330 wells fracked in the whole, uh, whole country. So it's around 80% crash from the level where we were early in the year. But on a positive side, in July, some frack spreads were actually added back uh, and activity rebounded back to the level where it was in April. Uh, uh, as soon as oil prices improved a little bit. And some operators, uh, they're trying to prioritize the completion works of their drilled and completed wells. There was quite significant inventory which was built during the second half of the year. A lot of wells which were drilled in quarter four, 19, quarter one, 20, they were not completed on schedule in quarter two and they're being completed now. So it is quite unique uh, event in the history of the industry when fracking activity is able to increase while drilling activity remains at the bottom. Uh, if you take a closer look, basin by basin, it is really the Permian Basin which drives this recovery. Uh, in the Permian Basin, we saw 230 fracked wells in July. Uh, so it is actually uh, 20 to 30 percent higher activity level than was recorded in April. Uh, and already uh, in the first week of August, we identified 75 new started frac operations. So we anticipate that fracking activity uh, will not recover further from the level which was reached in July. 
uh, but there will be overall uh, roughly 25% higher activity level in quarter three compared to what we saw in quarter two. And this activity will really be supported by the inventory of Druid and completed wells, which was accumulated in quarter two this year. Uh, when it comes to production curtailments, um, you know, all these activity declines, which we saw in quarter two, they were not sufficient to resolve uh, the challenges which physical market was facing on re already in April. Uh, we had severe storage issues in the country. And for the first time in the history, the whole industry had to contribute to production declines with additional deactivation of already producing wells or just some partial shut-ins, uh, the well started producing with restricted flows in some cases. Bakken and North Dakota was the state which was affected the most by these curtailments. Uh, in uh, March to May 2020 period, in these three months, we recorded around 500,000 barrels a day of production shut-ins in North Dakota alone. Uh, different operators, they were affected in different manner. They chose different strategies, a lot of smaller private producers on the bottom of this list, uh, they were able to deactivate most of their back-end production in a very flexible manner. Uh, we also have EOG, Conoco and Continental uh, in this group, in addition to private producers. But many larger companies, producers like Hess, Equinor, or QP, they chose different strategy and they didn't really shut in any of their back-end production in that period. In June, Volume started coming back, as we already saw uh, in the previous slide, based on the company communication. Uh, and specifically in Bakken, most operators, uh, they exhibit positive production change in June relative to May, based on the preliminary production data. There is only one exception. It is uh, formerly the largest producer in North Dakota, Continental Resources. They actually kept most of their production offline in June. So the, the key message here is that uh, the, the timing of reactivation actually varies quite a lot from operator to operator. And we will see quite different production profiles when July and August production data is released. Uh, in Texas, we also have sufficient uh, data coverage for June uh, to uh, say something educated about uh, final production estimate for that month. Uh, we also see, uh, see modest positive production tendency, but driven just by a handful of operators. In relative terms, uh, Texas didn't see as deep cuts as North Dakota, but majority of operators, they started restoring production all only in the end of June. So we won't see a significant production increase before July empiric data is available. Uh, just to mention some examples, ExxonMobil, Chesapeake, Endeavor, Parsley Energy, also Ovintif and Simarex, they can be viewed as an example of large producers, which actually brought back significant production already in June in, uh, in the Permian or Eagle Ford basins. Some operators were talking about so-called flash production events uh, in their quarter two reports. It is true that in some cases, when a well is shut in for several weeks or sometimes months, uh, when it comes back online, you see increased production compared to the production level uh, uh, which was observed prior to the shut-in event. So these chart just shows some uh, examples from the empiric data. These are some Chesapeake's wells in Eagle Fort, and all these wells, they saw these flash production events when they were brought back online in June. Uh, now, when it comes to the outlook uh, for the remainder of 2020 and 2021, I think we are heading to the period with very interesting production development, both for oil and gas production in the country. Uh, it is quite clear that oil production is increasing right now. Uh, and this is really driven by reactivation of curtailments uh, and pretty strong fracking, which is uh, observed in quarter three, 2020. So we anticipate that oil production will actually bounce back to the level of around 11.2, 11.3 million barrels a day. But by the end of the year, the potential which we have in the existing DUC inventory will be depleted. And then the drilling activity will have to increase before we can start seeing uh, reasonable completion activity again. So there will be another period of gradual production decline. In our view, it will start in early 2021, 
and it may last until late uh, 2021. But from quarter four 2021, we might accumulate um, uh, sufficient potential uh, in the new drilled and completed inventory to deliver on increment of fracking uh, so production can start growing again. But this increase is really dependent on uh, uh, a positive tendency in WTI oil prices. In our current base case, we anticipate WTI to average at $44 per barrel next year with a gradual improvement from low 40s in the beginning of the year towards high 40s in the end of 2021. And the shape of our production forecast actually changed quite substantially just in the last few weeks, uh, driven uh, both by the empiric satellite data and also the latest uh, quarter two earnings and updated guidance. Um, we were quite surprised by the magnitude of frac activity recovery in July. So some completions have been front-loaded, which results in higher production potential uh, this year. But simultaneously, drilling activity is not recovering. It will remain low in the foreseeable future. So uh, as we move towards mid-2021, the potential for the completion activity actually gets lower. So the growth, the next growth phase is uh, getting delayed. Uh, it is important to remember that activity uh, doesn't have to go back to the record high levels, which we observed in 2018, 2019, in order to restore positive production tendency. And this is a really unique feature of light oil reservoirs, because the base decline, the pace at which production falls if the industry doesn't complete any new us, it is a very dynamic function of the actual activity level. Uh, if you look at the red line on this chart, uh, which shows first month base decline uh, for the whole industry, it increased quite quickly in 2007 to 2019 from 200,000 barrels a day in the first month to almost 600,000 barrels a day. This is how much we had to offset every month uh, this year just to keep the production flat. But now as activity slowed down, base production becomes much more mature and this process is happening much faster than uh, what we saw in the previous downturn in 2015 and 2016. So in the beginning of 2021, we'll only need to offset 300 to 350,000 barrels a day every month to keep production flat. Uh, ultimately, it means that it will be much easier for the industry to restore positive production tendency, even with modest increase in the activity level, the number of wells or the total completed footage. From the medium term perspective, in our view, uh, uh, the recovery won't be absorbed in all oil basins uh, in, uh, in the similar manner. It is really the Permian Basin, which will gradually account for larger and larger share of nationwide activity and production. In our view, Permian is the only region which can return to the previous peak production level already in 2022-2023. And by mid-20s, we anticipate that Permian will produce 6.5 million barrels a day, which will account for almost a half of nationwide oil production at that point of time. Finally, I wanted to say a couple of words about the outlook for the gas production. And gas, any gas outlook is much more complex compared to the oil because the gas production growth in 2018, 2019 was coming from both some gas basins, Appalachian and Hainesville, but also a lot of growth came from associated gas, Permian and other oil regions. And what is quite interesting when we do different sensitivity analysis, um, and we do it in a very granular manner, uh, looking at every individual company portfolio and uh, rolling it back to the basin level and ultimately uh, nationwide outlooks, we arrive to pretty uh, interesting rule of thumb, uh, which could be uh, broadly summarized that 50 cents of Henry Hub price is equivalent to $10 per barrel of oil price. Basically, it means that if you reduce Henry Hub price by 50 cents, you need to compensate with $10 per barrel increase in oil prices to arrive to the relatively similar gas production outlook in the country. Another key message on this chart is that in our view, uh, we need to see both oil prices at $50 per barrel or higher and Henry Hub prices at $3 per MBTU or higher 
to um, uh, uh, deliver on a sustainable medium term production growth in the country. If we reduce one of these prices, if we go, let's say, to $40 or $3 Henry Hub scenario, we can still get to some production recovery to the previous peak level in the short term. But as we move towards mid 20s, the commercial inventory gets depleted either in gas basins or in oil basins. In our view, in our base case, uh, it, it is really the Permian Basin which will drive most of uh, production growth in the country in medium term, also on the gas side. Uh, dry gas production in the Permian declined a little bit uh, in this period of oil production curtailments. It actually improved local gas prices at Woha. And it, it is recovering already now, and we might see that Permian returns uh, to the previous production record of around 12 uh, BCF a day already in mid-2021. Uh, there were many challenges related to takeaway capacity in the Permian in the last two, three years, specifically on the gas side. Uh, Gulf Coast Express uh, 2 BCFDA pipeline, which came online last summer, it reached full utilization within 15 minutes, a really unprecedented event in the history of the industry. Uh, and uh, we have two other pipelines, Permian Highway and Whistler, both uh, now in the construction phase. And in our view, we won't really see too many new delays on these projects, both will come online. And on paper, uh, we don't really need any additional pipelines in the Permian anytime soon. However, <laughs> there is still some complications related to inability of the industry to fully utilize export infrastructure from West Texas to Mexico. We saw an increase in flows on some of these pipelines in the last few weeks as uh, some connectors, more and more connectors have been finalized on Mexican side. But in our view, it will still take several years before West Texas to Mexico exports can become comparable with the total takeaway capacity available. So most likely uh, we will need new takeaway projects from the Permian uh, already in late 2023 or early 2024. So there are still several projects which have been discussed. None of them, uh, none of them has reached FID state yet. Uh, but in our view, Permian uh, gas is still the right place to be for the midstream companies focused on the gas uh, activity. So I think this concludes my presentation. Uh, so I will now pass it back to uh, Stu so he can say some uh, final remarks. Hey, thank you very much, Artem. That was absolutely wonderful. We sure appreciate your presentation from Norway. We also appreciate Rystat Energy as one of our key sponsors for the oil and gas, our 25th year.